working with Organic Valley and um, delighted to be here sharing with you what we have learned. And when I say we, it's actually we as a community in Organic Valley, what we have learned about high forage ration and all forage ration. And so I'll be making the distinction uh, every time I focus on a 100% grass. So you will see the difference in terms of um, forage management and forage quality required for each type and also the nutrient demands and how to supply them. Um, what I would like to do for the next 40 minutes is to focus on the things that uh, we know so far that can be managed by the farmer. And one of the very first question that I get to ask every time is if we are going to, be, to do forage rations, high forage rations, or 100% forages, the question is how high can you go and make sure that you are meeting the dairy cow nutritional requirements? And so for many things, uh, we, need, we need to talk about what actually limits the dry matter intake. And in that case, what are the things that we can say that if we want to see a healthy dairy cow, lactating dairy cow, um, being fed 85% forages, what are the things that we need to have in place in the farm to make sure that we cover all the things she needs? Personally, I am, I've been doing this health and nutrition connection since I started my career. And more and more, I see the fact that we need to make sure that in order to have a, a thriving, healthy, vibrant dairy cow uh, meeting all of her requirements, we need to focus on the nutrition of the diet she is being fed. Ruminants are the only ones with the ability to unlock the structure of fiber in forages. That's why I like to focus on the plant quality because if that's going to be what is going to make the bulk of the ration, we need to make sure that whatever the cow needs or the rumen microbes need to make sure that they are efficient at breaking that cellulose compounds we need to make sure that we are providing the best we can for that cow to have the best room and environment. And with that, I'll be touching a little bit some of the biochemistry of the plant material that they are being fed, and also the quality and the characteristic of the rumen that is able to be very effective at getting glucose out of cellulose. So the focus for the rumen is to have the characteristics of the high quality plant particles in there, the adequate microbes in the rumen, and also adequate pH in that environment. But let's define what is a high forage ration. Because when I was working as a conventional nutritionist, I used to put together rations for um, 60% uh, concentrate, 40% forages. And that ratio changes as the farmer uh, target the milk production. Now, working mostly with uh, farmers that are organic and pasture based, then we need to define what is a high forage ration. If we want to follow the national organic program, there is a certain percent in the ration that must come from pasture. But now we are talking on the whole season, non-grazing season and grazing season. So we define a high forage ration, a ration that is 75% forages and about 25% mixed grains. What does that represent in terms of forages? Well, if we say that a cow can potentially eat three and a half percent of its body weight, then we define that for a standard 1200 pound cow, eating that three and a half percent of their body weight, it is about 42 pounds of dry matter. That's the daily intake. And 
If you are on a 75% forage ration, you need to come up with 32 pounds of forages. That is at a 75% forage. And the rest, about 10 pounds, will be considered the grain supplementation. If you are on a 85% forages, which is a pretty good close number for the average members that are doing a high forage ration, then 35 pounds of forages and six pounds of mixed grains is mostly what we talk about as far as high forage ration. Of course, we also have a grass meal program. And like Dan mentioned, this is a special, um, a special a group of farmers that are feeding no grain. And in that case, 42 pounds of dry matter is equal to 42 pounds dry matter of fishes. What I'd like to share with you this morning is in their ability to meet these requirements, the challenges that they have met so far, the lessons they have learned, and what I've seen so far profile of a successful grass mill farm. I want to list some of the main challenges. For the sake of time, I will focus more time in some of these aspects than others. But the number one challenge that uh, a farmer that wants to implement a high fresh ration or an all forage ration is that they need to be very comfortable about doing inventory. That is making sure that during the grazing season, they do have the, the number of acres that it will take to have the number of cows they have completely sustainable from their farm. And for the non-grazing season, making sure that uh, the tonnage you're getting, and because we have weather challenges, you need to make sure that if your forage inventory does not meet the requirements for the three, four, sometimes five months of the non-grazing season, you have the ability to provide in a timely manner the forage quality that they need. The second challenge is to have not just forage quantity, but forage quality. And for that, many farmers have found themselves with the ability to up their technique in harvesting high quality forages. I have to say that that can be learned and that can be obtained. So many farmers that can have a record of the forage quality can take a look at that and see what have been the challenges that, that kept them from getting a higher RFQ forage. Number, uh, the third uh, challenge that I consider also very important is knowing the genetics of the herd that will take to be on a high forage ration. And so I will touch bases on that and the type of breeds and the genetic selection that have shown to be successful for high forage ration. The number four um, challenge is how available you have um, premium forages in your area. And if it's not just forages, what is your willingness to provide on a timely basis the supplementation that the cows might need when the inventory is not adequate? So, Sylvia, if I can interrupt just for a second, um, I just wanted to give you a little background. I, I was talking with her the other day about uh, how they decide to pick somebody up as a grass only. And again, not as I'm not encouraging people to tell people we should do this, but they basic, she basically ranks them you know, according to each of these criteria. And you're pretty honest with them, aren't you, Sylvia, about this isn't for you because your inventory isn't good enough or if you're going to do this, you really have to change your forage quality. Absolutely. So I am very, um, very focused on that because I have seen uh, so far uh, with the experience of farmers that thought that they were ready for that 
and so they realize that they they cannot produce the amount of forages that that a cow needs if it's on a hundred percent grass so yes i'm very in you know intentional about that and the fifth um, challenge is to have um, adequate mineral supplementation if you realize that your forages are not quite up there in terms of the mineral profile. I always say that a dairy cow is being milked twice a day and twice a day minerals are exiting her body. So you need to make sure that if so far your forages are not quite um, uh, highly mineralized, you need to make sure that you are ready to provide a adequate mineral supplementation. This is the challenge for, um, for the grass-fed dairy cows. In my opinion, the, the program had evolved from the 100% grass-fed beef cows. And so we are now learning the lesson on what it will take to do that on a dairy cow. And in the slide you see, I outline only two factors that we need to consider to make sure that we are grazing differently and that we are also providing forage quality differently because to me um, they are two different animals. The average lifespan of a beef cow is about 24 months um, plus and minus and the requirement for that cow is about 16 megacalories per day. The average lifespan for a dairy cow is between 6 and 15 years and that's on a, on a pasture based uh, dairy farm. The requirement for that cow on a daily basis is about 30 megacalories. So producing 15,000 pounds of milk per year demand a high caloric intake. And you will hear um, very often the fact that I highlight um, the energy um, requirements of the cow. And um, that's why I make the recommendation that you need to make sure that you, you, you do an evaluation yourself before you engage on 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 a hundred percent grass not a high forage ration uh, but a, a hundred percent dairy ration because depriving the cow with the energy that it needs to meet the requirements um, will result in an overtaxed animal and uh, the well-being uh, might be compromised so um, there is the significant difference between that high forage ration and 100% uh, forage ration. And so the challenge also is that you, you need to be on 100% grass year round. And because grass doesn't grow year round, only very few areas in this country, so we need to focus on, on, on the non-grazing season making sure that we are providing for them um, when the pasture is not available. And the challenge of the genetics, um, a, a grace type uh, cow does have a different anatomy and um, a behavior and a pattern of grazing. So for that, I definitely uh, focus on making sure that if you have been selecting uh, your cows and you want to move on on that high forest ration, um, the characteristics of the breeds um, and the traits you choose uh, play a very important role. And finally, I just want to mention that there are added energy expenditures when you talk about the high forest ration on a pasture base. So I'll be um, calculating and showing you what are the extra uh, nutrients that we need to make sure we cover in order to have everything that uh, that dairy cow requires. This is not my slide. I like to take um, the calculations from, um, you know, average um, nutrient requirements, what we know so far, both from research and from practical data, what is what it takes to be uh, covering all the requirements for energy. On a dairy cow, on a 30, 20 pound body weight, the maintenance requirements for energy is about 10 megacalories, 9.7. And if that cow is milking about 50 pounds and on a 4% butter fat, 
it requires about 12 megacalories per day. Now, if we account that we need to increase the demand because of the grazing related activities, we go from zero when they are not grazing to five, up to five megacalories per day. And that depends of course on the distance they're walking and the topography of the paddocks. If it is a bred um, animal and uh, there is accounting for that additional calories required for maintaining the pregnancy. And there is also accounting for the tissue loss. Uh, what is uh, lost due to respiration, digestion, everything else that is into account. What I summarize here is what we have as far as the basic nutrients. So taking into account the calculations for the normal physiology of a dairy cow, for a 1,200 pound that requires to have the pregnancy and the maintenance and everything, we are looking for 30 megacalories per day. In terms of the other important nutrients, we need about 12 pounds of non-fiber carbohydrates. These are your sugars, your starch, everything that does not come from fiber, and about six pounds of protein. So these are the basic things and basic calculations that I typically go through with my farmers. And with that, I want to start talking about the number one, and then I'll mention the number two challenge. So of course, by now you will see that uh, the number one challenge for ultra high forest ration is meeting the energy requirements. And you wonder why is that? Well, we know that the relationship between how much a cow eats and how much a cow produces in milk is very much directly related. At the same time, it is a direct relationship between intake and the quality of the pasture, and we can say also during the non-grazing season, the quality of the forages being fed. You can see in the graph that during the early part of the plant growth, the cow actually have no nutritional limitation for getting a high dry matter intake. A very palatable, bendable, flexible grass blade tastes very good to a cow. And she's able to consume a large amount of forages at that point. Very young plant also has some excess that you might need to uh, balance with feeds in the barn, the grassy hay, or maybe some additional energy to balance the protein. But the main point in here is that once the quality of the forages decreases because of the maturity of the plant, there is a nutritional limitation for that cow to meet her own nutrient requirements. So the dilemma is, is when you have your forages in the farm, you need to know when is it that you need to get that high RFQ hay. If you are not able to provide that high quality forages throughout the lactation, at least you need to know when is the most important point in her life cycle, in her life, in the, in the milking curve, that you need to provide that higher forage. As you can see, the demand during peak production and the time when she's trying to breed again is the right time to get the higher quality forages. The demand for her are at its highest, and this is when you need to know how much and what kind of quality you need to provide. Now let's talk about pasture quantity. Um, I like to do the calculation when the season is that I'm talking to. We have right now no pasture available, at least in this area in the country, but we will have to face that. And this is a picture that uh, shows sometimes the density of a paddock. A low density 
pastor affects how much a cow can bite at one time. So that a specific number of bites that she will take before she fills the rumen is filled and lay down for rumination. The low density paddocks do increase the eating time. And that means that the more time she spend looking for the right amount of paddock, the right amount of grass, you decrease the number of rumen fills she will get per day. Very quickly, you realize that that will limit how much a cow can take for dry matter intake on an ultra high forage ration. I would like to quote um, Sarah Flack, and many of you know her, and she has been working and doing consulting for uh, farmers that are on a high forage ration and also on a 100% uh, ration. And so she shared with me what, what she thought uh, will be their requirement in terms of acres per head. And so uh, her suggestion is that for successful farms, they need to be between five or six acres per head. And then she also added that the most successful ones, she's seen them doing uh, eight acres per head. By now, some of you might be raising, you know, thinking, well, maybe I'm not ready for that. I think if we strategize and make sure that if you don't have the acres, at least you plant, you plan ahead what are the forages that will take you on a higher forage ration and having it within your acreage available during grazing and non-grazing. This is a picture of um, uh, a forage um, that is now being advised, and I advise that, to have consistently every summer to grow an annual warm season grass. You can choose either BMR, Sorghum Sudan, Forage Sorghum, Straight Sudan grass, but I think it is very important to make sure that you make that forage quantity available for that cow. The second aspect is the pasture quality. And with that close-up picture, you will see a variety of species in there. Now, I believe in diversity in the pasture, diversity um, every time, whatever she moves. And that means a good ratio of legumes and grasses. The University of Wisconsin had a very interesting research uh, done with organic um, pasture-based dairy cows and farms that were accounted for uh, more than the ratio of 60% grass and 40% legumes were the one with the higher quantity and quality in their pasture. Just something to think about if you need to renovate your paddocks if you are thinking moving toward this direction. So let me recap in here, what are the characteristics? I have this slide and the next slide to uh, talk about the forage quantity and quality. So take a look at this. So the nutrients we are looking for that provide the energy that this cow is looking for are mostly in the leaf portion of the plant. Non-structural carbohydrates, the sugars and the starch, account for 25 to 35 percent on a young plant. Now in the stems we have for NDF, neutral detergent fiber, between 35 and 70 percent, of course that depending on the maturity, the height of the plant. So if we want to make sure that we want to have a uh, a cow targeting ultra high forage ration, we need to have a cow that can graze um, a good set of leaves, stems that are not completely lignified, and to have on average a 60 to 70 percent stability. It's putting and I realize that for many farmers, um, the acreage dictates 
um, the amount of forages they will have available. But this is what we know so far, and this is a research um, published a couple of years ago already, that highly digestible forages, every time you increase a unit in NDF digestibility, which again is something that it is reported in every forage analysis that you request in any um, reputable lab uh, will give you that number. So for every one percentage unit increase, I will say about 55%, you will get about almost half a pound of dry matter intake. And that on a 4% fat correct milk can result in a half a pound of milk. That is a target for this season that we have in 2017. I, ha I want to sh uh, share with you um, the ration that I did for um, a farmer. This is not on a 100% grass farm, but it will show you what will happen when I take the six pounds, the, actually the five pounds of grain that is providing in this ration. This is something that you will get if you request a ration review if you are an Organic Valley member. So take a look at the ration here, and it shows that it is consuming about 25 pounds of barley silage, about 25 pounds of baleage, that is 51% dry matter. And as a supplement for a higher quality forage, this farmer purchased uh, Organic Valley hay from one of our growers, and is providing 10 pounds of that hay. Take a look at the profile in the energy. 0.73 megacalories per pound for that purchase hay. For the, for the haylage, he's providing 0.68 megacalories per pound on that barley silage. And on this baleage, 0.67. I will encourage you to take a look at the energy in your own forages and see if you are able to provide this amount. You see that in this column, the net energy for lactation, this is where you met the energy requirements. Here we have only about half a pound extra for crude protein. And this is for a cow in mid lactation, targeting 45 pounds of milk. The grain supplementation is a mix of barley, corn, and oats. So here we have about five pounds on an as-fed basis for grain. So if I take this grain supplementation away and I do not have a better quality forage in terms of energy, the energy that is provided by the grain must be supplemented by a higher quality forage. This is how you simply balance a ration when you go from low grain supplementation to no grain supplementation. If you want to say, here is my energy from grains, what kind of changes I need to make in the profile of my pasture, in the profile of my hay? And this is how you target that. So at this point, I want to show you what are the, some of the questions that I get from the farms that are feeding a high forage diet. There's not much supplementation that you can make, but there are some things that you need to make sure you change. One of them asked me, does it pay to feed probiotics for a cow that is consuming a high forage diet? Well, take a look what the probiotics, the, um, the yeast supplementation that they can get. Well, actually, if you improve the ability of that fiber particle to be broken down and more effectively have access to cellulose, which the ruby microbes can definitely digest, you will be providing more access for them to produce the glucose that they need. Sometimes it's just a matter, a calculation of the cost of that ration if we will allow you to buy molasses or buy supplemental yeast and very limited supplements that are allowed for 100% grass, you need to make sure that you account for those expenses. 
Here is a very basic calculation for feed cost. I am not an economist, but every time I provide a ration, I like to put the cost and how much is going to be covered by the milk production. So this is the basic for a 1200 pound cow consuming 42 pounds of dry matter intake. If it is provided year round, and for that I mean I'm including lactating cows, dry cows and calves, it is about seven and a half tons of forages that will be required. And with a basic yield of four tons per acre, you need to find out whether you have the amount of forages that they will have as a requirement. Will they pay to buy higher quality forages if you don't have it? But take a look at this simple calculation. If you purchase $350 per ton hay, that is about 17 cents per pound, and you are feeding 42 pounds, pounds of that hay, the feed cost is about $7.14. That's during the non-grazing season if you do not have the forages that you need from your farm. Will it pay to buy that kind of quality? Well, if we are during the grazing season, this is a standard estimation of the cost of a ton of pasture on a dry matter basis, about $100 per ton. That is five cents per pound. Multiply that by 42 pounds of dry matter intake, and the feed cost is about $2.10. A cow producing 35 pounds of milk, paid at 35 cents per pound, and this is a price that can be up or down depending on how you're getting paid. The gross income is about $12.10. 25 cents. The income over feed cost on an all hay ration purchase completely is about $5.11. And if you are on an all pasture, it's about $10.15. That's a very basic calculation, but can teach you a lot about your ability to either pay for additional hay or making sure that you are providing these quality forages during the grazing season. The cheapest way to feed a cow is no question about that, is providing all the forages from pasture from your own farm. So what's the strategy? Number one, provide high quality forages. Number two, make sure that you have some local growers that can provide you a very good quality hay if you need to supplement your own. And for me, I highly recommend to put in the plan to have a warm season animal growing in your farm. It is, um, it is a, an insurance for that summer slump. And I think if you can um, make it good into baleage, I think it will definitely provide, can provide year rounds, grazing and non-grazing season. I do have this that I share with my farmers. These are the quality parameters that I'm looking for, both in the pasture and in the silage. And I'd be happy to provide that um, along if anybody would like to take a look at that. So how quality affects the intake? Take a look at this. If you go from a medium quality forages with 50, 48% NDF, and you improve that to 38% NDF, you are able to increase the intake of that forage, and you can move from 30 pounds per head per day, consumed from that, to 38 pounds. And we all know that the more a cow can eat, the more the potential to increase milk production. And it all boils down to room and fill. I always ask the farmers just to sit down and see how many times you see a cow eating and laying down. And for a 100% grass-fed cow, you must get at least four room and fills per day. This is a picture I like to share because um, these cows, and you can quality that rich, 
and the forage quality at that point is fairly low. So what are the signs that I'm looking for uh, as a veterinarian to check whether nutrient requirements are being met? I like to think of the early lactation, where I am to provide those elements for that cow during the most significant, most important part of the milk production. And it's during the peak lactation. When you don't provide that energy, you actually see a poor peak milk production, poor peak persistency, and the cow is not able to put the body weight that she is losing in the very first part of the lactation. Low body condition score is something that needs to be addressed um, if you're going to keep the cow on a 100% ration. And one of the things that I have been looking at is uh, really calculating the conception rates on cows that are going through the first part of the lactation without provi being provided the energy and the protein that they need. All boils down to me to the calculation of the non-fiber carbohydrates in your forages. And this is something that should be targeted not just for the nutritionist, but also for the farmer as well. Number two, the second challenge for the ultra high forage ration and some of the lessons we have learned is to make sure we can balance the highly digestible pasture protein during the cycle of the grazing season. This graph shows what are the protein available for the cow as the season goes from grazing to non-grazing season. The blue color line represents the protein that is required by the cow, and the green line represents how much protein is available in the diet on a 85% ration. As you can see from the pasture, we have an excess during the early grazing season. And during the summer months and early summer is when do you actually have a, a, a good balance of the protein supply and the protein required. What I'm saying with that is that when we see the milk urea nitrogen increasing, we need to make sure that we balance that. There is a high cost for a high MUN. And understanding how much energy is actually subtracted from the mammary gland by the liver and the kidneys to make sure that they break down that ammonia compound and produce urea. It takes energy and it was very interesting to find out that some people have even have calculated what is the cost when milk urea nitrogen exceeds 16 and that's milligram per deciliter for more than three weeks about seven pounds of milk when MUN is more than 20. It results in low conception rates, lower immunity, and of course, it results in environmental losses because of the excess urea putting out in the environment. At this point, I want to uh, make sure that there are some questions. It is about um, 11.14. Um, Dan, would you like to check if there are any questions so far? Any questions so far? Tony? Is it a given that we're going to have to accept higher money values on these high forage diets? You're talking about 16 to 20 range, and you know, if they're nutritionally balancing for some reasonable high milk production, we all like to see it lower than that. Yeah, so are you going to talk about some tricks to bring it down, or is that where it's going to live? Level, were they going to be high or do you have some ways to bring it down? Yes, definitely. It is something typical to have a higher MUN for a high forage ration. That is actually expected because of the nature of the ration. But the strategy is, is that during the early grazing season, um, the excess nitrogen can be balanced with additional non-fiber carbohydrates provided to that cow and highly high quality grass hay. Now, the trick is to make sure that these cows eat that hay 
And if you can provide that non-fiber carbohydrates in the form of sugars. Molasses is about the only supplement that is allowed for grass milk. So make sure that you provide the molasses that it takes to balance the excess nitrogen. It can be done, and I have seen it over and over successfully, lowering the MUN from 18, 19 to 14 when you provide about a pound and a half of molasses per head per day. And like I say, the calculation for covering the cost, I love to go over that because I definitely see it does pay back to make sure that you provide the better quality hay, grassy hay, when the excess nitrogen shows up in the report, in the milk urea nitrogen. Any other questions? Right. Is she saying that you buy the dry hay or they go to pasture? What quality is hay is that? Okay, so um, Sylvia, we, you and I talked the other day about um, giving them dry hay before going on pasture uh, in the context of helping their, getting their manure to be less, uh, less runny and um, sort of helping them to capture the quality that, that's there. What can you tell us about the quality of hay? That was the question. What quality of hay do you need to motivate them to actually eat it? Definitely. Um, the cow will not eat a hay that is um, completely uh, mature, uh, lignified. Um, and, and farmers always complain, oh, they will not eat it. But they will not eat it if it's not palatable and if it's not uh, a quality hay that will encourage their intake. I'm looking for an RFQ of about 180, which represents that on a, on a mostly grass hay, the fiber digestibility is above 60%. That will provide glucose for that cow. Even if the cow consumes only five to six pounds of this kind of quality hay, she will be able to get from there a good amount of glucose, digestibility, particle that will be able to hold the, the, the rate of digestion and the rate of passage in that rumen, holding it enough so the rumen microbes have the opportunity to digest it. So if it's not the higher quality hay, molasses, has been showing that can definitely provide the amount of carbons that these bugs need to make sure that they convert this nitrogen into more rumen microbes. It is possible and it, is, it, it can be done. It is more a management uh, factor than a cow factor. How, how are they, how are they uh, supplementing the cow with molasses? Are they, are they putting it on their hay or? So, so uh, assuming you have several farmers that are successfully supplementing with molasses, how are they getting that molasses, molasses into the cow? Is it sure? Or is it? Um, can you see? I don't know if you I move the slides. I don't know if you are able to see the pictures. Yeah, we can see it. Okay, so this is from a grass mill farm. Um, molasses, and, and for that case, uh, I should mention that is sugar products that are allowed in the grass, the 100% grass milk program. Uh, it can be molasses or it can be dry sugar. And for the molasses, um, you can have the molasses pour on top of the forages and they can easily eat that. Um, people can uh, provide the molasses in a link tank, tank, and molasses is sometimes mixed with apple cider vinegar, and they pour it on top of the hay, and they do uh, increase in dry matter intake once you do that. So even eating the same quality feed, you can increase the intake. Now, the molasses is not changing the fiber digestibility, I have to say. Neither is the apple cider vinegar. What they are doing is that they are providing the tools that the rumen microbes need to make better use of the forages. Yeah, we have another question. Um, I always wonder with these 
really high forage diet that it, it seems like forage and pasture maybe it's possible on paper to get really high quality but it's really hard to be consistent and especially consistent like a whole year a whole grazing season that there's a lot more especially with pasture but also just with, with grass silage or hay there's a lot more inconsistency there than in your typical corn silage or grain portion of it do do these grass milk farms and high forage farms does their milk bounce around quite a bit uh, if Dan, if you can repeat the last part of his question, it would be great. Yeah, he's talking about the, the, the fact that the forage quality bounces around through the course of the year. Um, and it's uh, not as controllable as everybody would like. He's wondering if the, the lactation yes. uh, also bounces around on your grass milk farms. I guess maybe I would add to that. Um, if you're talking about some of your more carefully managed grass milk farms, what What's the higher end of the level of, of lactation that you're able to see on average over the course of a year? There's no question that the variability of the forage quality throughout the year, throughout the seasons, in and out, is the, is the challenge. It is uh, very comfortable and very easy on, with a TMR on a, on a daily basis, provide the same thing day in and out. So that's, that's, that's easy to do. There is a challenge with, with the grazing and the forage quality. It can be done, and I have seen it very successfully, uh, but it does require a higher management of your grazing. It does require that you take a closer look at what are the species in your pasture that are not, not there, providing the quality protein or the higher energy in there. So uh, I have seen farmers going uh, no grain, and being able to keep 48, 50 pounds of milk. These are the ones that are on top of the game every day in terms of the dry matter intake. That whenever they realize that their own baleage tested uh, using an RFQ index of 140, they know that they need to be looking for a higher RFQ hay locally that can complement what they have. So the consistency will come when the farmer learn to balance that ration with their own forages. And until they are able to put a baleage that is 0.71 megacalories per pound, which is not, um, not done every year, not even on the farmers that can do it in one year, you cannot guarantee that you will be able to do it next year. But that's when you, as a manager, look for the complementation of your own forages. And that will be in terms of forage quality and on a timely basis, making sure that that ration is balanced with some additional non-fiber carbohydrates like sugars available for them. Okay, it is a, it is a game of balancing the ration for the cow. So if no more questions, I would like to just show you um, a couple of pictures. We have one uh, more question here. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I'm curious with the, the impact on reproduction. Um, we know that the, the decreased body condition score is going to impact that, but do you think the high nitrogen is having a direct impact on the reproductive tract and the young embryo just by the ammonia being a toxin? I, it wasn't very clear, but I think, I, I, I guess the question is, is directed toward the high MUNs and the way it changes the, the cows. Um, He's uh, asking if the, the high MUN results in ammonia levels that are actually toxic to the developing embryo. Yes, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. It does impact uh, the higher urea. Um, it is in the blood, so it goes through every single organ, every single cell. That's why we have lower conception rates. It's actually putting the pH of the blood on a more alkali uh, level, and so the ability of that ovary and that um, um, 
uh, environments of the uterus, it changes completely as the blood is on a higher pH level. The same thing with the immune uh, system. So yes, that's why it is so important to make sure that whenever we see, and we can use the MUN as a way to balance the ration, we provide changes into that ration. Um, lower fertility rates have been reported, not just uh, grass milk, it's whenever you see a cow that have either acidity or alkalinosis in their blood. Either extreme produces low fertility rate. Other questions? Okay. All right, yeah, go ahead with your next slide that you were going to. Sure. So I just wanna show you a couple of uh, pictures of 100% grass farmers that have um, beautiful animals. So this is uh, Mr. Kennegi Kine in New York, beautiful herd. Uh, I saw excellent body condition in these cows. And I have to say, you know, we have farmers from the West Coast, and the East Coast and in the Southeast. This is a farm, a whole Jersey farm in California. And um, it has been shared with me over and over that every time the, the farmers uh, focus on a crossbred animal, they take the traits of the grazing ability and um, you know, mix with the Frisian cows. Um, I have to say, before I get any comments on the breeds, is that even on Holstein cows, farmers that are on 100% grass uh, with Holstein cows, they have been breeding for their best grazers. So it is a matter of selecting the traits for the kind of ration you will provide into these cows. I saw these beautiful calves in Ohio, um, calves that have been grazing um, and are moved as often as the uh, lactating cows are. So these are farmers that are focusing on rumen development early on on these animals. Just show you um, beautiful manure that I saw also just going through a paddock uh, in Ohio, a, a grass fed farmer, which typically we see we're going to see just running manure or uh, this is just a close up of, you know, a very good consistency and we are looking for um, to make sure that the farmer does provide that uh, hay supplementation. For me as a nutritionist, I always like to see hay in the ration uh, year round, grazing and non-grazing season. Um, baleage, uh, fermented feeds can do very well, but there is also um, that particle size, that particle uh, a functional that can help that rumen to have a much better um, digestion. This is one farmer uh, that has his own control of the flies during the, during the summer season. I think it can be done. We can always find something to improve in our farm. This is a, um, a farm that I visited that had a very um, a good level of grasses and it's an improved paddock. And he saw a beautiful, we did a clipping and we thought, we thought this beautiful 60 to 40% ideal ratio of grasses and, and legumes. Um, you, you can achieve it. You probably have to uh, target some specific species that are missing in your paddock. Um, any other questions? Any questions? I heard a producer who does a lot of grazing um, on his farm talk about using some sodium bicarb in his in his supplement to those animals on pasture, and he said that it helped his component significantly. Is that something that you've heard? Usually, uh, you don't. I wouldn't think of it as being something that you'd be giving to a pasture animal. But what do you what do you think about that? Well, yes, I do have actually farmers that are. Um, providing free choice uh, sodium bicarb, uh, Redmond salt, kelp, and during the grazing season, they see sometimes, especially in the early part of the spring, 
that they see the cows consuming more sodium bicarb. And of course, um, this is a buffering agent for the rations. But I have to say, uh, most of the farmers realize that when they are during the grazing season and providing good quality forages, that sodium bicarb is not needed. The cows chewing um, those forages, and the saliva, improvement in higher amount of saliva does provide the bicarb and, um, and the uh, buffering of that rumen. So it is intrinsic in the nature of the high forage ration, that ability of that cow to ruminate and the rumination uh, much better because of the increased um, sodium bicarb naturally from the saliva. And what grass species do you see people using to make this ultra high quality hay that you're trying to get into them sometimes before they go to pasture? Um, most of the time I'm referring on a high quality grassy hay. And um, because of course, if you are putting an alfalfa hay, uh, it will bring again a higher protein level and that's not exactly what you target before the cows go on pasture. So most of the time it's a, it's a mix grass, orchard, thimothy, rye grass, um, with targeting a crude protein on about 12 to 14 percent crude protein the most. Hmm. But that's a little tricky. I mean, it seems like a lot of the hay that you see at 12 to 14 percent has relatively high fiber levels, at least <coughs> in the examples that I see. What do you, how are you seeing people overcome that challenge? Um, sometimes you need to look for that uh, type of quality hay, but again, this is why for for this high 100% um, forage ration working, you need to have a good network of what you are not able to produce. Mm -hmm. So that uh, digestibility on a 100% grass hay need to be still uh, between 55 and 60%. So whenever you see 14% grass hay but a low digestibility, it is a, just a mature hay stand. And again, that, that will not work because um, the cows will probably not consume enough before they go out on pasture. Any comments or questions before Sylvia signs off? Uh, just uh, the relative feed quality is what she's looking at is the indicator and the RFQ uh, that I'm looking for, and that's during the grazing season. Uh, it's probably different during the non-grazing season. So let's begin with the non-grazing season. The type of hay that will complement a medium to low quality forage for 100% grass, it should be 180 RFQ. That means that the NEL, the net energy for lactation should be around 0.7 megacalories per pound. The protein percent on that higher RFQ is typically uh, around 21%, 21, 22%. That's an ideal hay supplement during the non-grazing season. During the grazing season, when you have those pastures with highly digestible protein, you need some effective fiber, non-lignify, but effective fiber to hold on that digestibility and rate of passage, hold on that rumen, and you need to look for an RFQ of about 140 with a protein level 12 to 14%. When the pastor is at as high as 25, 27%, you need to be looking for a hay that is on a lower crude protein, but still digestible enough so it's palatable for that cow to consume. Is that, that hay is 145, is that, could that be typically first cut hay? It sounds like... So you're, um, he's asking if the 145 RFQ hay would typically be first cut in your experience, or what do you, are you seeing that usually coming from second cut? Around second cutting hay most of the time. Just from, from experience on our farm over the years, um, we try to do some dry bales and a second crop. And that's what we're feeding when they're grazing. And they crave that. So 
early, early in the in a grazing season when they come in really full, mm -hmm. they'll lay down and ruminate for a while, but they're going to get that second crop. They'll go to that before the grain is even harvested. So we're not an all grass, we're high grass, but they love that stuff. It does not. And I have to say, I have seen it consistently. Every time we help the members to source this kind of quality hay, uh, it, it only take about a week uh, or the next report when they start to see the MUN coming down. Mm -hmm. And for people that are not on the 100% grass ration, definitely to have corn silage um, is, a, is a good match. Uh, corn silage with the digestibility of the starch in the corn and the pre-fermented plant material does have a nice uh, way to complement the high protein, um, uh, less NDF pasture in the spring. So um, it is just a strategy to have the, the corn silage also as a supplement, not, not as the main forage, but as a supplement during the grazing season. All right. Well, thank you so much, Sylvia. Let's give Sylvia a round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Have the rest of your day. Thank you. For the rest of you who are online, we're going to pause and start back up around 1 o'clock.